Hello and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the Foundation. We're the nonprofit partner to the National Archives. Through this foundation programming, we're pleased to open the virtual doors of the archives and share the holdings of more than 15 billion records, objects, films, letters, drawings, photographs, and most importantly, the stories of our nation's past. Thank you for joining us from home today for another history inspired conversation. Our fall virtual programs are kicking into gear. The museum here in Washington is open, so please visit archivesfoundation.org to stay up to date or follow us on social. In fact, right now, you can click that little subscribe button on the YouTube and help us grow our network. Our guest speaker today will take your questions later in the program, so use the uh, YouTube chat box. And as always to practice, and I see we've got a lot of folks practicing right now, drop in your hometown and state and I'll give you a shout out later on in the program. Now to our featured speaker, let's jump right into it. Meredith Evans was appointed director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum, administered by the National Archives in November of 2015. She's the first African-American woman to direct a presidential library. As director, she focuses on civic engagement, the role of the presidency and public policy and making accessible the records of President Carter, his cabinet and the White House administration. She's written on the role and value of museums, libraries and archives. And Meredith has earned degrees from Clark Atlanta University, North Carolina State University and UNC Chapel Hill. Meredith, are you there? I am here. Hey, Patrick, how Excellent. are you? Excellent. Good, I can see you, I can hear you. How are you and the staff doing? Fantastic, I have to say, everybody is happy. We, we talk every Monday, the whole staff and everybody's doing very well, so. Excellent, well, I know we're all, we're all eager to get back to regular times, whenever that might be, we're, we're inching our way there. But I know you've got a great program for us. It's a bit of a birthday party we're having. I don't wanna spoil anything, but I know you've got a lot to tell us about President Carter uh, the museum and everything you're doing down in Atlanta. So I am going to pass the screen to you and let you take it over. It's all yours. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Well, this is an honor and fantastic to be here. I'm really excited this evening to share my thoughts and some images of the Carter Presidential Le uh, Library Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. I have been a lot of firsts in uh, my time, but uh, this one is the, one of the highest honors I've ever had. Next slide. When I met the Carters for the first time, um, for what I thought was an interview, before I could even sit down, President Carter said, congratulations. Uh, he asked me one question, and he asked me if I had ever been a federal employee. And then he asked the architect of the United States, who was with me at the time, if this is who he wanted for the job. Um, I knew then that there was no turning back <laughs> and to serve a living president as and the American public as the first African-American woman to run a presidential library was really, it's really pretty amazing. Next slide. When I reflect on taking this job, I can't help but think I was meant, to, it was meant to be. I actually wrote President Carter uh, a letter inviting myself to the White House for my birthday party in 1977. I sent $1 that I borrowed from my sister and a penny, because I had that. And to, to help defer the cost is what I was thinking. Um, uh, he returned the money <laughs> and he sent a note uh, letting me know I could not have my birthday party at the White House, but he also sent me a brochure. I still have the dollar, I still have the note, and my mom has the brochure. I guess I was an archivist even before I knew what that meant. Um, I feel like that I've come full circle and as, I train, as a trained archivist, it was really exciting to see my letter in the collection. And I'll show you where that was a little later. Uh, but it also, now that I'm older, reminds me to tell everybody, if you write a president or a government official, it is public record. And I think anybody can get a public access to your note or letter or card. So beware. Next slide. So President Carter turned 90 on uh, 97 on October 1st. So I thought it appropriate to do a birthday theme as Patrick kind of gave away. <laughs> uh, he was born during the depression. 
Uh, and he was actually born in a hospital because his mother was a registered nurse. Uh, that building still exists today in Plains, Georgia. It's a nursing home named after his mother, Miss Lillian. Um, when I think about President Carter and his birthday, I wonder um, how he celebrated, what it was like, um, and why I couldn't have my party at the White House. But it's not really about me, so next slide. So this is um, the Daily Diary. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the records that are in the collection. Um, that's the next few slides. Uh, president Carter's Daily Diary, which every president has, they have a diary that um, continues to check their, all their meetings and all their telephone calls, whether they had them or not. It's a running list. I guess today is probably digital, probably in somebody's phone, but back then it was all typed up and, or handwritten. Um, President Carter is exactly how he is in person as you see him in the news. He's a family man. He has strong faith and values and that's reflected in the official federal records and consistent in his leadership. This is the schedule of his first birthday in office. It's only one page, um, not much going on that early, uh, but like my birthday, it was with family. And in the evening, you can see the last five bullets of, that, um, of this slide were all phone calls from his sons. And the first phone call came from his grandson, Jason Carter. And Jason, like both of his grandparents, uh, Joe, uh, grandfathers um, and his father ran for office. He served as a Georgia State Senator and he also ran for governor in 2014. President Carter's birthday fell on a Saturday, um, but he still had cake and he still had ice cream and all of those fun things. But before we go on with the daily schedule, I think we need to go back to Plains real quick. Next slide. So everybody remembers Amy because she's the youngest and grew up in the White House, but people don't realize President Carter actually had four children. <laughs> he and Mrs. Carter had four. So I thought it'd be worth it to show this photograph to you all. If you look at the back row, um, you will see all of the boys, <laughs> Jack holding his son, Jason. Yes, the Jason I mentioned earlier. And then there's Jeff, um, uh, President Carter. And then to the far right is the second oldest, Chip. In the front are all the wives, Mrs. Carter and Amy. Uh, it's important to know that there are sons because all of the sons campaigned for their father around the country with their families. And so it wasn't just Amy after all. Next slide. So let's go back to the Daily Diary. One year later in 1977, 1978, October 1st, um, the Daily Diary was six pages, not one, six. Um, he had quite a busy day, uh, but he still managed to go to Sunday school and still managed to spend some time with family. Next slide. What I love about this, I had to highlight it, I couldn't resist. I should have invited myself to the White House for my birthday this time in 78 because uh, he took Amy, the whole family went to the Kennedy Space Center and then they went to the Cinderella Castle at Disney World. So I really should have tried to get on that trip. I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I was too young to notice. Next slide. So before the pandemic, we used to celebrate President Carter's birthday at the library with an admissions to match the year. So it would have been 97 cents for every visitor. We always have um, some type of music or choir or band playing things that he likes, um, a huge birthday cake and always an oversized card for visitors to sign. In lieu of the card this year, um, we decided to do something online. And so you're watching that right now. Uh, can you next slide? 97 years in 97 seconds. <laughs>
So all of those photographs you saw in there are in the archive as well. Um, you probably caught uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in there. If it, he hadn't appointed her to district court, she might not have been Supreme Court judge. So thank you for that. Um, this image is an image of our campus. After President Carter left office, um, he went back to Plains, Georgia, but decided to build the Carter Presidential Center in Atlanta. Um, rightfully so, because Plains is actually two and a half hours from the airport. So quite a drive for a researcher to go. Um, the Presidential Center is named that because it's a linguistic umbrella for all three entities, the library, the museum, and the Carter Center. The Carter Center is an NGO and the library and museum are federal. So if you look on the first left, uh, I guess you're right, that left side building is the federal building. It is actually a federal piece of property along with federal staff. Um, we do have a branding issue. We're still considered the Carter Center. So we throw in presidential so that people know there's three of us on that, on that campus. It's also important to know that President Carter's birthday is significant for him as the longest living president but us and his family, but also for the library and museum. It is the anniversary of the museum and library. Next slide. So in celebration of President Carter's birthday, the library and museum opened October 1st, 1986 um, with the two separate entrances, the museum entrance and the research room entrance, the library entrance. Um, Traditionally, a past president attends the opening. So what you see there is President Reagan and wife Nancy. They were in attendance and President Reagan also gave remarks at that, um, at the opening. Next slide. The Reagans also stood obviously um, by Sarah Carter to cut the, who cut the ribbon when standing with her is her brother who? Jason, <laughs> uh, um, so he's there too. And so I just love that picture. It's just a family affair, it's consistent. Next slide. Since we opened in 1986, just, we just, I just wanna show you some of the past exhibition we renovated in 2009. Um, and in 86, the museum community was different. We weren't doing digital things at that time. We weren't doing a lot of video and audio. Everything was very traditional and tactile. So what you see here is the um, a wall of presidents is what it was called at the time. That's soon to be replaced by something else. You'll see. Next slide. This is the early life, um, which most of the libraries begin with the context of when the president was born and some of the early artifacts of their life. If you look in that picture, you'll see uh, Mrs. and President and Mrs. Carter together. That is actually their wedding photo. And in current day, we actually have a replica of her wedding dress next to that same photo. Next slide. Confronting Nuclear Threats was, this was the exhibit that spent a lot of time talking about the Cold War and the formation of the Department of Energy. President Carter created the Department of Energy out of multiple units in the federal government. It was divided into two sections, non-nuclear federal energy and policy and programs. And the second um, entity was exploration of the field of nuclear energy. Next slide. This actually is uh, Camp David. And you will see as we move, um, when we show you the newer pictures of the newer exhibit, um, Camp David was one of the most amazing um, events of President Carter's career, um, the Israeli-Egyptian peace, um, peace treaty. Next slide. So in 2009, the museum closed for six months and did a $10 million renovation um, and expanded. Uh, what you're looking at now, those glass walls and those boxes, um, that actually was a, a solid wall before it was, uh, but now you get to see the actual records. So if you look at the bottom shelf on the far right, my letter was in one of those boxes, inviting myself to the White House. Um, but it also, if you look underneath the glass, there's a line of sort of um, furniture boxes. Those are actually representations of each of the presidential libraries. So instead of the presidential wall, um, when they renovated, they did one of each of the presidential libraries 
And then each monitor talks about um, what archives are, what the presidential libraries do, and the significance of their relationship with the National Archives. The other part of this is to show what it means. Uh, it, it talks about museum um, objects as well. Um, we preserve all the gifts received by the president and first lady, whether it's from North America or from abroad. And these gifts, especially ones from foreign governments, aren't the property of the president. Um, if they really miss it and want it after they leave office, they can buy it back at market value. So this image is the start of the new exhibition. This is just one section of the gallery that is about the um, beginnings of his early life. We have a copy of his report card, um, his high chair, lots of things, uh, neighbors and people that were influential in his life all the way from his childhood until he became governor. That's this section. Next slide. So this, we, when they reimagined this gallery, they actually did an extensive um, part on his campaign. Uh, and that's why I showed you the picture of the family. All of the children campaigned on, uh, were on the campaign trail, include, and also the peanut brigade. The peanut brigade were Georgians that had um, campaigned with President Carter when he was a Senator for Georgia. And so those people just continuously came around, traveled the country and campaigned for him. With that said, Mrs. Carter also campaigned and she is definitely one of my favorite first ladies. She's in my top five. She really has done phenomenal work. And she tells this story about how she was on the campaign trail and she was in a rural area doing on the radio station. And the interviewer kept asking her things like, what was President Carter's favorite meal? What does she like to cook? What does he eat for breakfast? And she finally stopped him and said, I'm not here to talk about cooking. I'm here to talk about my husband becoming president of the United States and the issues. And I thought, yeah, they, she, was, she was amazing right out of the box. Next slide. So instead of focusing on the events of um, the Cold War in this section and the nuclear threat, um, we talk about President Carter's naval career. While he was never able to actually sail in a nuclear submarine because that was a year later when that was finished um, being built, um, he did attend nuclear power school for a little while and he was, has extensive knowledge of some aspects of engineering and nuclear power and energy. So this is that section, you get to kind of feel like you're in a submarine itself. Um, he ended up leaving the Navy uh, when his father passed so that he could go home and take care of the farm. Next slide. Next slide. So remember the earlier picture of Camp David in the other ex elder exhibition, this is Camp, can you go back one? So we give you a sense of feeling like you're actually in the cabin in one of the cabins at Camp David. Um, this is one, again, one of the signature achievement of the Carter administration. Um, it led to his post-presidency career. He continues to do diplomacy across the globe. Um, and it also won him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2002. They actually stated in that, in his, um, when he was given the award, uh, they gave it to him for his decades of untiring effort for finding peace solutions to inter international conflicts to advance democracy and human rights and to promote economic and social development. And he still does that today. So the new exhibition really does chronicle his life, but also his post-presidency. Next slide. Next slide. So I can't, again, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta talk to Miss, Mrs. Carter, I gotta talk about her. Um, one of the major changes in this exhibition is that um, it highlights Mrs. Carter much more than it did in the past. 
um, her role in, the, in President Carter's career is influential. Um, she always says things like she doesn't want people to think she told Jimmy what to do, um, but she did stand firm by him and had her own things that she wanted to get accomplished, the Equal Rights Amendment, um, but most importantly, um, removing the stigma of mental health. Um, Mrs. Carter, uh, when they returned back to Plains, she helped with the family business. She campaigned. When she was in the governor's mansion in the White House, she began to fight for the Equal Rights Amendment. She has her own, um, her own political role in some sense um, um, along the way. So in particular, I really wanna highlight the mental health. So we're gonna show a video in the next slide. Next slide. There are not many former First Ladies of America. And when one of them puts her shoulder to the wheel and says, I'm going to work on this and keeps at it for 30 plus years, there is an effect. To say it's important is an understatement. One is to speak out and get people talking about mental illness so that, that everybody in our country can realize that it's just an illness like any other illness. We know that mental illness is a disease as any other. It can be diagnosed, it can be treated, and almost everyone suffering from mental illness can be helped. One of my best programs are mental health fellowships for journalists because we were brainstorming one day, what else can we do to overcome stigma? And somebody said, why don't we educate journalists so they'll know the issues, know what we know about mental health issues, and then can report it accurately. And it's been really successful. When I became involved in Georgia, nobody would talk about mental illness. Nobody wanted to be involved with the issue. Less than a month after Jimmy, uh, was in office, he passed a resolution calling for a President's Commission on Mental Health. We worked for four years, made a list of recommendations, and actually got them into a bill and got the bill passed. So I will end looking at the exhibition in this way. Um, we do, there's quite a bit of the um, museum is the post-presidency. Um, this is a map table. Um, it's very interactive. Kids love it. Adults love it. You can actually go to different countries where the Carter Center has done um, diplomatic work and especially for the health programs, remove, um, eradicating guinea worm, um, trachoma, river blindness, um, as well as some peacekeeping missions. You will find you'll be able to do that all on that uh, map table right there. Next slide. So of course, the majority of our visitors only know us as a museum, which is why I spent time earlier showing you the records. The heart of the institution are the collections and are the research room. Aside from President Carter in the research room, um, you know, we've had journalists like Kai Bird and Jonathan Alters, who books have just come out. Um, we've had former administrators like Stu Eisenstadt and Gerald Rafshoon as well. Um, and, and we're open to the public, so we don't deny anybody. Students have come by um, from college students and K through 12 and the general public. We try to make sure we have something for anybody to see, even if they don't have an immediate appointment. Uh, Carter has obviously used the collections. He's sitting in the reading room now <laughs> in that very room. Um, he does all his research and preparation. He's written over 30 books and he's got a ton of op-eds that he probably still has waiting to kind of um, put, send to the New York Times or, or Wall Street Journal when he's ready. He's an avid reader and he's an avid writer. I'm sure he's got more books up his sleeve. The collection also includes official records of the Carter administration, personal papers and family records. And we've created a, a, a collection specific to Mrs. Carter, who's her, uh, an author in her own right. She has five books herself. Um, so she has a collection that's uh, separate from his as well. So with that said, um, the Daily Diaries have been extremely um, interesting and Mrs. Carter has her diaries and notes as well. And we can't wait to have that collection open and available to the public. So with that, I'd like to end with a comprehensive tour 
um, that I'd like to share with you this evening. It's kind of done um, with um, sort of a drone video. It's, it could make you a little sick, but it gives you a better sense of where we are in Atlanta. We have a beautiful skyline. And so I hope you all, when the pandemic is over, find your way down to hot Atlanta and come by the Carter Presidential Library and Museum. Next slide. I guess we won't end with the video. Well, we might be able to come back to that. I think we're having some Wi-Fi delay. Oh, here we go. So I will say definitely come visit. Um, we're probably the cheapest thing in town and the most fun. We have beautiful grounds with gardens and flowers in the back as well. So um, I hope you come by. Patrick, I'm ready. Question away. Excellent, excellent. I highly advise to, to come visit. It's a terrific museum uh, and experience. Um, I can't remember what we did. Was it, it might have been right after you showed up, 2015, 2016? We did 2016. A terrific, terrific set of Mending programs. Mending America. Rights and Justice uh, with President Carter was amazing. Um, so let's jump in. I'm going to take a couple of the obvious questions off the table for our audience. Uh, hopefully, there'll be softballs for you, and then we'll jump in. We've got some terrific questions coming up. We've got a great group of people here. Um, so, and, and just to give you a flavor, Scranton, Pennsylvania, Madison, Wisconsin, a uh, whole bunch of Washington, D.C. area and outlying areas, Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, New Orleans, uh, Phillipsburg, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Houston, Frisco, Texas, Austin, Simi Valley, I guess you're friends of the Reagan Library, you're learning a little bit about the Carters, uh, Nevada, California, Bellevue, Washington, Buffalo and Poughkeepsie, New York, and of course, Atlanta and Plains, Georgia. So welcome to everybody who's joined us today. Um, so first thing, we always get the question, so I'm going to ask it. What if, if someone wants to jump into his life uh, biography, do you have a recommendation? 
Yeah, I think Jonathan Alder's uh, book right now is probably my favorite um, read. It's, it's, Kai Bird's is good as well. It's a little more um, biased. I think Alder really talks about the beginning to the end in a very um, easy read. Um, if you want to get facts and figures, do Eisenstadt's go is good as well, but it's, it's super detailed and it's really thick. It'll remind you of being back in a, a college history class. Um, but yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, we need both for our, our viewers. Uh, we definitely have the, the history nerds uh, who would join us and we love folks who wanna get the introduction. So thank you, those are terrific. Um, so what about the, the family? You mentioned along the way, is the family, obviously the president's involved with the, the center and the presidential, is the family also involved um, with yeah, the Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, def definitely. Jason Carter's chair of the Carter Center board. So we bump into him quite often and, and the family's very, um, every day they don't have any pomp uh, you know no they're not pompous at all there's there's they're very laid back um we actually have kids about the same age uh amy jason and i all live with uh, probably within 15 20 minutes from each other so we can bump into to the grocery store to, and you know that's like hey how are you um and chip is in planes and he's actually rebuilding roofs for people's houses and helping everybody update their electricity i mean they just really are a family based group of people who take care of the community and they will continue to do that for a really, really long time. Great. Well, so you actually brought up a good question, um, uh, a good point that the question came from the, the audience about the records. So uh, I do have a follow up on research, but one of the questions was, we know the presidential records are there from the administration, but what about pre-presidency and post-presidency? Are those all kept there or are they elsewhere? No, actually they're not. So the governor's records are at the Georgia State Archive, which actually shares property or is right next to another national archive. So um, we all are within the city. The Carter Center maintains their own records, but we do have some copies of things. Like we have some of the final reports of the Carter Center. And we did just, we do have some of his personal papers, not his manuscripts, but we do have like the family photos. Um, we have some personal um, manuscripts in terms of like essays and things that he's written or, or letters. And um, we have Mrs. Carter's stuff from her administration, but also some personal things. So we have a nice, interesting combination of collection materials. They're just not all processed and accessible to the public just yet, but they, but there will be, we're coming, we're getting there. <laughs> so that's a great, great lead in to my question. So obviously he's very prolific with the writing, but uh, obviously, folks are still coming to do research. Don't we know everything about Jimmy Carter and the administration? I mean, what, what are folks, re I know obviously it's been closed because of COVID, but what are folks coming and doing research on these days in the, in the research rooms? Right. Well, you know, pre-pandemic, we had a ton of filmmakers in, in the library. I mean, Atlanta has become a film town. We actually ended up doing an exhibit on President Carter as governor creating the film commission in Atlanta, in Georgia, and how that work that he did has led us to having, you know, every major filmmaker here in the city, Marvel and Nickelodeon and Fox and all of these people, all these movies are being filmed. Um, but then people were coming in and, and literally doing documentaries on him. There's the rock and roll president that's just came out about nine months ago, um, Miss Lillian, a film on his, on his mother. There's one on the Iran hostage um, conflict. So a lot of documentaries, and so we have a lot of footage, we have a lot of film, we have raw footage from um, different networks, and then we have existing footage from White House photographers and film people. So that was the big thing. And then whatever becomes popular, whatever's in the news, that's um, like when Argentina was heavily in the news or China's heavily in the news, everybody always comes and looks at Carter, Carter papers, um, that's all there. It's interesting because we put solar panels on the roof of the library. Um, I noticed, I noticed. That. Everybody remembers Reagan taking the solar panels down and we actually have an original solar panel in the exhibit, but we actually put solar panels on the white of the museum as well. He couldn't be more pleased. He put, President Carter put solar panels out in planes and that actually um, helps with the irrigation. So, uh, you know, there's things that we do that he's always around and available to talk about. Um, and I will finally say that he's in the curriculum. He's in the Georgia standards. <laughs> so if you're in second and fourth grade, you're definitely going to see some Carter stuff and you're going to come visit. And that's amazing. 
That's terrific. I was actually just chatting with a colleague today. I was wondering, like, I wonder if they have any of the original solar panels there. There we do. you we go. Have one. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Mrs. Carter, I know you're a fan. I uh, talked a lot about her work in mental health and uh, talking about being ahead of the times. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about that over the last you know year and a half with everything, uh, students, children, uh, adults uh, stuck at home, trying to figure out how to get through all this craziness with the pandemic. She was frankly really ahead of her time. Did she have an inspiration? Like was, did she look to Eleanor Roosevelt? Are there others that she might've been inspired by that, or did she just take this on on her own? I think she took it on on her own. And I think that, um, you know, President Carter's mother had a lot of influence on her. Miss Lillian was, you know, she was a Democrat. She was a supporter of LBJ. And, you know, before his father passed, his father was a segregationist for a while and he ended up um, sharecropping and doing some things before he died. And so it was a really interesting balance um, that you can see uh, President Carter has learned from the value of hard work, but the value of also finding your own way and being outspoken. And Miss Lillian, his mother, was quite outspoken. And I think Mrs. Carter knows to have a voice. I think she has a very supportive relationship. Um, if you ask them how they can stay let married for 70 years, she's going to say things like, we do things that we like to do together, and then we know what to do when we are apart. <laughs> um, so they like, you know, she's just that lady. She likes to go fishing, and she's always just she always knew that women were equal right um and that she's from that depression generation that's how they were raised to sort of be a step behind the man and she's never had to be in that role with her husband president carter to this day calls her boss lady you know and i think um she's never been smothered i guess um she has a degree uh she's very she's fun she's fun and quite intelligent yeah Excellent. All right, well, we have a couple of questions that get more into, I won't say policy, but more about his time in the White House. Um, he considered himself an outsider uh, from Washington, as other presidential candidates and successors to have as well. Um, some consider that a problem for his agenda. Would he agree to that or did he find value in that sort of outsider uh, perspective on his time in office? I think he finds value in the outsider, um, that outsider viewpoint. Uh, I think if you look at his first term, his first year, I think he himself realized that he couldn't do it all with by himself. He didn't have a chief of staff until very late into the first year he was in office. Hmm. And I think that's when he realized um, he, as much as he likes to read and as much as he wanted to know everything about everything. Uh, he needed somebody to help with that as well. And that's what a chief of staff does. Um, President Carter to this day still reads everything. When he used to come to the office every year, people would, they would pick which program or which group would present. And he would have read your report three times over and probably would have asked you questions. It was very nerve wracking <laughs> at the time. So um, he's an avid reader and having a chief of staff really helped him. So I think when he came into office, I don't, I'm not even sure he considered himself an outsider. I feel like he felt like he had done Georgia politics, he knew enough, um, but that he was ready to make changes and support the American public in any way he could. Um, and I think the things that people criticize Carter about are things that really speak to how he was raised in his value system. It's not that he wanted long lines at the gas station, you know, but he did want people to be frugal and balance their life a little better so that we could have, we, until we got the energy situation resolved, right? Um, but he's also a child of the depression, you know? And I think that if you know people who lived through that or live, you know, we're going through the pandemic now, you know, people who live through the flu epidemic and things like that, you will see your behavior shift and he governed the way he was raised. Um, yeah, I don't think he would consider himself an outsider per se. Mm -hmm. so those life experiences show their, uh, show their ways in lots of stripes, you know, when yeah. you're in positions like that. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have someone who's, who's watching who was in Egypt in 1979, and uh, there was a lot of appreciation uh, by Egyptians for what he did. Did he ever visit shortly thereafter um, uh, to, to feel that appreciation? I have 
actually have to think about that. I, I believe, I do know he's returned. I just don't know what year, if he did it during his presidency or not. I have to really think about that. And I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. I mean, I know he's returned to Egypt. I know he's, but I don't know how long after um, the peace treaty. That's a good question. That's something to look up. I'm gonna write that one down. <laughs> what has ever asked Excellent. you that one before? That's see, see, we always we always get one curveball, which is good. That's that's why we have our audience with us. Uh, can you talk a little bit more? You touched on his military service. So where did he serve? Um, any any more detail you might share? It was actually a short stint. He was in Annapolis, and then he did a couple of tours. They did go to um, Germany. There were a couple of places abroad, but then he um, he really wanted to serve on a submarine, so he did that. Um, you know, it's actually interesting because. Mrs. Carter really enjoyed being in the military and seeing the different places. And when his father passed and they returned to planes, she wasn't very happy about that. She really wanted to stay traveling. And to this day, they, well, before the pandemic, they used to travel a lot. Um, they go to Argentina and go to different countries um, to see the world. I think that that desire um, to see the world really, really made him go into the Navy. And I think while you know, rightfully so, he left to take care of family. Um, I think if he had stayed, he probably would have been one of the first people on that nuclear submarine and really been doing some amazing things. Okay. Um, I have another specific question. Does the center or uh, I guess the museum have information on the Alaska land work that he did as the president? Yes. And see the branding issue. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we actually have the papers about um, Alaska. We have um, um, anything that was related, some of the discussion between him and his staff, because um, everything in that day and age was in memos. We didn't have email then. Um, so, and people took minutes. So we have a lot of information on that, how the decision came about. Um, and when it was made and all of that is in there. And we even have some images and um, topography maps of the area. So um, it's a really, that's a really challenging situation too because he really believed he was doing the right thing. And there's, you know, a large group of indigenous people that feel other, you know, feel differently. So um, it's, that's a challenging thing, but, you know, again, he did, you know, it, it's better than having oil everywhere. I think, but that's me. <laughs> so I have a fact check question. I've not heard this quote, so if this is way off, uh, but a question uh, that this uh, viewer heard earlier in life that Jimmy Carter once told the KKK he'd flush a dollar down the toilet rather than give it to them. I, that is true. I can't remember the exact setting, um, but that is, that is a true statement. Um, you know, when he, you know, it's interesting that he won the governorship in Georgia at the time because he actually lost the first time he ran. He ran against a segregationist and he ran a pretty neutral platform, but it, it didn't, he didn't win that first time. And then second time he did win and he really spoke out in his governor um, speech about um, coming together and removing segregation. Georgia was really late in the game, um, desegregating schools and desegregating things. It was really in the early 70s when all of it happened before he really got into office. So um, he did make that statement. I can't remember the full context of it, but that it, it was something along those lines. Um, but he, you know, he's still living and you know, I can't, I can't be mad that, that, that mad at him, <laughs> that mm -hmm. statement either. Um, so yeah. let's let's turn to the museum a little bit. I've got some good questions for you. Uh, first is, are there any good children's books about uh, the Carters or the presidency, his his presidency? There aren't actually. There is. Um, so Amy Carter wrote a book, but it's not about the presidency itself. Um, she wrote a children's book. Um, there is one, and I'm trying to remember the author, it's a picture book that's actually pretty good. And then there's a junior novel 
Um, and recently there's a comic book, a comic book just came out and I can't figure out where to buy it, but literally a comic book came out on his birthday about his life and his time in the administration. So there really aren't many, a lot of the books focus on, you know, farming or peanuts, not, not about the administration. I think there's about two that focus on that and they're both picture books. Okay. An opportunity for the budding authors and yeah. those who want to come, come and do research at the, uh, at the library. One of them I think is out of print actually. So yeah, that's a good idea. If there are any children's authors out there, <laughs> this is the time. Um, do you, does the museum have any um, resources on a virtual basis, obviously right now, and they do in person for elementary students who might be able to access uh, programs now? Yes, we have actually, we have lesson plans online and then we should on our YouTube channel, if they're not up already, we have a couple of um, lessons that our education specialist has done that should be online. There's also some in the NARA education um, unit. So if you go to the National Archives page where the education resources there, there are, there are two or three um, units on President Carter as well. And then you can always email us directly. Um, it's education at carterlibrary.gov. Um, then the education specialist will send you resources that he's developed along the way. Um, in fact, there's a presentation next week, I believe, um, about Amy Carter being in the White House. <laughs> so he's in the curriculum. So we've quite a bit. I will also say Google culture. There should be two things on Google culture. One specific to, I think it's fourth grade curriculum um, and one for eighth grade that's online. And I'll find those links and I can send them to you, Patrick, so you can post Excellent. them. Excellent. And your, your team is quick to the YouTube chat. They said they also have lessons on your YouTube channel. So that's what I said. I knew we had go. some stuff on the YouTube. <laughs> Always surf around the YouTube. Always um, I know we're, we're getting a little bit to the to, close to the end. I wanted to just hit a couple other questions here. Um, going back to the first lady, and I should have, I had this in my head and I forgot to ask. So uh, Rosalind Carter talked, obviously, could be very committed to mental health. How did she end up on that, that topic? Was there a family background or do, you, do we know why she championed yeah, that? There, it, there was some family um, that suffered from different kinds of illnesses, mental illness, and it really bothered her. And um, she was, you know, she being in the governor's mansion, she saw in the, in the city and in the area that there, this was a need. Um, so that became really close to her heart. But yes, it was, there was a, two family members in fact that suffered from some mental illness and she wanted to remove the stigma, particularly in the rural areas where people you know, were name calling and, and just being you know, mean like they do today, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, she's made real, real strides, real strides in that, not just by going to um, the Georgia State Senate, but also in current day, she's got a journalism program which around the world where people are learning about mental health through the media, which is really rare. So it's been really great. That's fantastic. Um, so just uh, the museum, just trying to sneak in a couple more questions here. Uh, and and our, our, our viewer might have missed this if you, if you mentioned it. Is there an exhibit in the live in the museum on the Iran hostage situation? Yes, right before the post-presidency, we have a wall with um, the Iran hostage information on it. Um, you know, it's really interesting because we have a lot of footage and photographs of President Carter at the desk, really show, trying to show the American people how hard he was working to release the hostages. And in actuality, he, you know, we can battle over who really did it. But at the end of the day, he did it. <laughs> but it was at that point, it was too late. He should have, you know, people say he should have been campaigning instead of sort of trying to do that. He could have done both at the same time, but that's not what he chose to do. He, 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 he lives off of his value system and he wanted people to know that he was working hard to successfully free those people um, rather than campaign, you know, kiss babies and wave. That was not what he felt was important. Um, but again, that could be also why he lost the election. Um, that's one of the main theories behind his loss is that he hadn't freed the hostages, but also he hadn't campaigned either. So it's a, it's a tough time, but there is a, a section on it in the library. And it's, it's, I think it's equitable. You know, It doesn't say he did it without help. It doesn't say that he was a complete failure with it either. So there's some balance there. 
Okay. And uh, it was, fingers crossed, we're moving into a place where all the presidential libraries will start to reopen and uh, communities are, are healthier and living with the, the, the new world that we're living in with COVID. What's coming up besides a birthday party that we just had? What, uh, what can folks who want to come and visit with you in Atlanta, what are they going to see? If some, uh, any big programs, symposia, uh, special exhibits that might be coming up you know, later this year or next year uh, as people plan? Well, <laughs> you're asking me to plan post-pandemic. Um, <laughs> no, it's really interesting. So there is a peanut festival in Plains, Georgia every year and a butterfly trail um, um, also in the summer. So we try to do things in conjunction with Plains, Georgia, um, because that's where he's now residing and spending most of his time. So you will see two kind of events, not just speaking events, but you'll see us do some kind of festival. We do host a farmer's market and things like that. And um, our grounds are beautiful. So people picnic all the time, but we are hosting um, the green book uh, from the Smithsonian. We're gonna host that exhibit when the pandemic is over um, and talk about um, traveling through Georgia um, and segregated Georgia of, of African-Americans. Um, and then we'll continue to do programming. We, we do school tours all day. So there's always something for the kids to do um, at, the, at the library and the museum. So, you know, come see us. You haven't seen Excellent. it before. You gotta come. <laughs> That's it, exactly. And I am gonna sneak one more viewer question. Is there um, any plans to turn their home into a museum down the road? Not right now, obviously occupied. Actually, well, yeah, actually they gifted a few years ago, they gifted their home to the national parks. So it's actually a national parks, it'll be a part of the national parks um, campus really, because there's the boyhood home, there's the farm, his birth home, and the old high school, the Plains High School has become sort of a museum that the national parks run. So now they'll include their house and they'll be buried there as well. So you'll be driving the planes. After you come to the museum, you'll be driving the planes to really get a sense of how he lived and what his life was like in planes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I recently visited the LBJ Ranch and got a, a feel for that. I've been to the LBJ Library in the past, but uh, and so I got a feel for that. And that too is, um, you know, there's a different perspective there when you when you go there. So I'm sure folks will make their way to planes so they can get the full Carter experience. Yeah, and it'll be like going back into time. I mean, it's, you know, the house has not been renovated. It's not, it's the same house it was, same, you know, same furniture and, you know, it's there. So that's not changing. He likes what he is, likes. I, I'm sure, I'm sure. It's very comfortable, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, we have come to the end of our time. This has been a terrific conversation. You are getting lots of kudos in the YouTube chat, which you can read from your admirers afterwards and we really appreciate your your time uh, there's a, also a lot of love a lot of birthday wishes for for president carter as you can imagine um and uh we've had a terrific audience so i want to thank you meredith for putting together the presentation giving people the overview we obviously want to encourage folks to come visit and don't wait for 90 cent day to, for <laughs> membership get down to atlanta and check out the, the carter presidential library and uh, learn even more. And uh, Meredith, have uh, good luck with the reopening as, as we Thank get you. to that point. And, and we're hoping to October 18th to be open to the public again. It would be time tickets, but we'll be open and ready to ready to go. I can't wait. Excellent. There you go. That's that's how we close our programs. Come get your ticket now. <laughs> get Terrific. Your ticket now.